You'll have these images in the background. And um, I should tell you that they're photographs taken by my friend Margaret Olin, uh, uh, the landscapes that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, before I begin, I just want to say that I would like to dedicate this short talk to Sam Schweber's memory. Sam was a um, devoted member, a longtime member of the Einstein Forum's board, and I have a feeling he would have found some interest in what I'm going to say tonight. Thank you. Yeah. I want to start with Borges. Jorge Luis Borges once said in an interview <clears throat> that when he was a young boy in school, he never believed his geometry teacher who claimed that the shortest distance between two points was a straight line. <laughs> and he was right about that, we know that. Um, I don't know if any of you know that in Indonesia, only demons travel in straight lines. That's why the entrance to an Indonesian home is a kind of zigzag affair, you know. So that's Borges. I think that for me, uh, somewhat similarly, already in elementary school, I never truly believed my teachers who tried to convince me that the Enlightenment ideal of beauty uh, as a matter of harmony, symmetry, and grace was correct. And you know what, I put this hesitation um, that I have uh, to attest this morning, I went for a walk in San Susi and I had the same reaction. I guess it's maybe beautiful, but not that beautiful because for me, beauty is bound up with dissonance, incongruity, and disjunction. Um, there might be a wider or deeper dimension of congruence that could, under the right conditions, emerge out of incongruity. And I also I tend to prefer quiet that is born out of disquiet. In fact, without the latter, the former for me is a superficial thing, lacking interest in traction. And this perhaps odd disposition of mine extends also to matters of truth and to right and wrong. I like the inimitable, incongruous beauty of the moral act in the service of a hopeless cause, with or without witnesses, with memory or without it. So tonight I want to examine the physical landscapes uh, where such acts may take place, landscapes where truth and beauty and untruth and ugliness are intimately, incongruously intertwined, where dissonance infuses and animates truth and can reveal, uh, sorry, animates beauty and can reveal truth. I am going to be speaking of the landscapes of the South Hebron Hills and their relation to truth. Even after all these years, despite what I've just said, I find it hard to contain the juxtaposition of malice and overpowering natural beauty. It feels wrong. Wickedness does not belong in these landscapes. How could the fierce sun of the desert not burn it away? I understand, I know from inside the particular sadness that inheres in beauty. The problem with beauty, said Hans Sachs, is not to understand it, but to bear it. That, however, is very different from bearing the presence of wickedness in the wide vistas of these hills. For a few short weeks in spring, the anemones push through the rocky soil amidst sudden bursts of green. The green does something to your eyes. I blink in unbelief. Then it's gone and summer happens, a burning white heat all day long until in late afternoon the hills turn mauve and blue for an hour before dark. Goats trickling over the hills amidst the rocks and thorns, white doves in their skyward spiral, white clouds over the open desert, wind, the cutting edge of silence, tents, caves, ruins, more goats. I've loved it from the start. And I assume that many of my Israeli settler foes love it too in their own way. 
though a certain leap of faith is needed if I'm to believe this deeply. I'll tell you why. We have seen settlers from the notorious site of Chavat Maon spreading poison in the fields of Palestinian Twane. I saw the deer that died from that poison and the goats who became sick. The idea was to poison the herds in the hope that their Palestinian owners would ingest the poison via their milk and die. Can you poison the land you love? Or is that perversely our human default? Then there's the sheer ugliness of so many of the settlements. The older ones by now have the red tiled roofs and stone facades that are meant to proclaim their permanence. These homes do not slip into the contours of the hills as Palestinian village homes do, but at least they are not as hideous as the drab caravans and spindly water towers and barbed wire fences of the so-called illegal outposts that litter the landscape of South Hebron. It's an everyday experience to watch settlers emerge with their machine guns from these miserable barracks as if deliberately compounding the ugliness. Guns are ugly. I know, I used to carry one too. Both beauty and ugliness may carry a moral valence, just as moral acts and wicked acts have their own beauty or ugliness, respectively, though uh, it is sometimes hard to tell which is which. And truth, as we know, and as we've heard already tonight, truth is not always beautiful. Still, a special beauty arises from moral acts performed without witnesses, acts doomed to fail. You may remember that Churchill said that lost causes are the only causes worth fighting for. His lost ca causes, however, were probably rather different from mine. Mine are relatively easy to define. I fight to prevent the infliction of gratuitous suffering on innocent beings, including human beings. I'm also in favor of trying not to create great tears and gashes in the fabric of existence, or as the Indians would say, not to hurt what we call God, who is more vulnerable than any of us. As it happens, for me, these battles take place in those landscapes of breathtaking beauty. Occasionally, I wonder if the settlers really see the landscape in which they have planted themselves. At the settlement of Carmel, Many of the newer homes are almost windowless, though Carmel is perched on a hill with a commanding view of the desert and the wadis. Why no windows? Do they wish to look only inward, away from the harshness, away from the shadowy figures whose fields they have taken? Yet I've met settlers in South Hebron who seem to me genuinely, in some sense spiritually, at home in the landscape and in love with it. Some of them are gentle souls who have strayed into a fanatical and lethal vision without meaning to cause hurt. Let us recognize that they too can love. Such mutations happen when a person thinks and speaks of an absolute. So we have a landscape ravishing beyond words or thought that is being cruelly violated, torn apart, raped, poisoned, destroyed, it is in, in the nature of a colonial venture to do that. The true custodians of these hills and terraces and valleys haunt them still with their herds and tents. As for the farmers, they have not lost the intimacy of a man or woman with the soil. How many times have I heard them utter the, phase, the phrases of despair to the soldiers who are driving them off their land? These are my fields, they need me. I have come to plant, or to harvest, to water, to plow. For them, the land is a living being in need of nurture. Just, la just last week, my friend Nasser from Susia, Susia is a village which is actually perched on the brink of demolition by the state. It could happen literally any hour. Nasser said to me, we belong to the land as she belongs to us. We grew up on her and in her, as she is in us, in our veins, and the pores of our skin, we need each other. He was speaking of a bond that only human malice can sever. One should never assume that rocks and trees and thorns cannot listen or know. In fact, 
I think they listen better than we do. Never underestimate the wisdom of a rock or the aliveness of a thorn. There are many degrees and modes of lying, but you cannot deceive a landscape like that in the southern West Bank. What one says and how one says it, whether with a semblance of truthfulness or without it, whether with the minimal humility that being human demands or without it, all this is the stuff of speech in the desert. If your mind is sluggish with worn out myths like most human minds, and if the dead myth and not you speaks through your voice, sooner or later you will be laughed off those hills. I've heard many lies spoken by soldiers, policemen, bureaucrats, settlers, and of course politicians in situations where Palestinians can, by virtue of their predicament, only speak their truth. In other, less fraught scenarios, they, Palestinians, can of course tell lies, but not at a moment of incipient or recurrent expulsion and exile, which has the inevitable effect of revealing truth, though the soldiers and policemen and their allies may not want or be able to hear it or see it. For everyone else, that ring of truth goes through one's body, and the body knows it for what it is. Not always, but often enough, we can trust this bodily knowledge that may filter up into action or thought. The human body is built for truth and for the knowledge of truth, though we may de deny ourselves this knowledge on most days. Stark natural beauty, truthfulness, intimacy, love, these elements are bound together in a single sorrowful amalgam. It is important to remember them in case the Israeli government has its way and the Palestinians of South Hebron are one day finally and irrevocably driven away. I'm afraid that's looking more and more likely these last few months. It's important to know that once there was a way of life natural to this landscape where together these vectors met and enhanced one another. And I would want to add a further set of notions such as courage, solitude, silence. I have learned to recognize these forces when I meet them in the field. Courage is not, I think, something that a person can know in himself or herself. It is something one notices in others. But solitude and silence and their implications for living are accessible to our self-awareness. I sometimes think that I am happiest when I am walking, either alone or almost alone under the sun and wind in South Hebron. I listen for the silence, which is never total, but which nonetheless can envelop the barking of dogs and the bleeding of sheep and the bird calls and also human sounds like children crying or wives chiding their husbands or even much graver in consequence, a mother screaming at the officer who has just arrested her young son. A dimension of solitude inheres in the landscapes of South Hebron. Many of the shepherds and farmers live in small khirbas, a tent or two planted somewhere on a hill, maybe with a goat pen attached, preferably somewhere close to a still usable well, although most of the wells have been stolen. Such places are isolated and extraordinarily vulnerable. Nights in particular are scary. Men with guns may turn up. Even when they don't, a dense solitude defines this way of life. It is a solitude that informs the sociality of a pastoralist's existence on the cusp of the desert. Brothers, cousins, children, aging parents, all are somewhere nearby. One is not usually quite alone. But if you stay for some hours with these shepherds, and if you're lucky enough to pick a moment when the settlers or soldiers don't appear, you can't help but feel in yourself the brooding power of rock and sky. Still, the shepherd's life is utterly unromantic. His head is full of matters such as counting the goats and calculating their feed and where water will come from and how to fix the tent or shack he lives in and how to ensure there will be food tonight and whom his cousin will find to marry and also modern issues like how to buy a good cell phone and maybe study at some college. And of course, on top of all this, how to survive the settlers' attacks and the demolition orders routinely handed down by the civil administration. And there are common medical concerns not so simple to handle on, out on the hills. 
As many have noted, solitude is conducive to a mode of truthfulness. Think of Henry David Thoreau. It's also possible that enough solitude may be conducive to courage. <clears throat> I'm often astonished to see how young shepherds respond to the soldiers. Sometimes these boys are clearly frightened. They cling to us, asking us repeatedly to stay close to them for their protection. And one can understand that. The soldiers sometimes threaten to kill them if they come back into such and such a wadi or use some now forbidden will. But very often, more often, I think, the boys are clear-headed and defiant. They can be forced to obey the arbitrary commands of the officers, and they know the potentially high cost of arrest. But the mere fact that these people are still in place despite the vast forces that have been brought to bear upon them, speaks to a toughness that comprises within it a stubborn courage. In a way, it's their greatest asset. That kind of toughness in the face of wickedness has its own particular beauty. There is something about being there that opens up your heart. The clenched, embattled quality that is our natural inheritance slowly dissipates over a morning or a day or a night. It's not something that happens in the thinking mind. It's not something you can strive for. All of us, however, know it, though we may never speak about it to one another. Usually we are caught up in the exigencies of the given moment. The border police officer who draws an arbitrary line in the sand and says, Whoever steps over this border will be arrested. The bureaucrat from the civil administration who stops the plowing and says, not today, or not here, or not there, or not anywhere, or never. The settler who rushes with his gun into the herd of goats and sends them fleeing toward the desert. The soldiers who have put up a roadblock of rocks and concrete slabs just for the sake of making life miserable and that we will have to take down at any cost with our bare hands, and so on. In such circumstances, it is up to us to say the most wonderful word in the language, any language, no. Just that, no, we will not allow you to do this. Do to us what you want, but no, we won't budge from this hill. We will record all the foolish and criminal things that you are saying and doing. We will take this evidence to the courts. We will fight you for every millimeter. We will be here next week and the week after that and so on, however long it takes. We will bear witness and we will say no and again no over and over until the end of time. You see what I mean about an ethical beauty, preferably involving some risk or danger? Recently, a young, very stubborn, high-handed lieutenant said to me at a place called Umm al Ahmed, as he was driving Palestinian shepherds off their land, now, we were arguing with him. We showed him the Supreme Court ruling that declares what he was doing to be illegal. He said, this um, lieutenant, he said, I don't need the Supreme Court. I don't need anything, any papers or words. It's enough for me that I have my gun. And we said, no, we refuse to retreat. The amazing thing about that word is that when you say it, under those conditions, although it's like rolling the rock uphill, for a brief moment, truth and beauty clearly and inevitably coincide. You don't have to think about it. It's something you know with your body. And since human beings, though clearly capable of being mesmerized by evil, are also drawn, perhaps despite themselves, to beauty, including dissonant beauty, I sometimes wonder if that singular kind of beauty is what actually drives us into Ayush to acts of witnessing and continuing resistance, even when we lose or fail, as is often the case. Perhaps the beauty of such acts may even be commensurate in some way with the physical presence of the landscapes that silently witness them. I began with dissonance and I end with bodily coincidence and with the conviction that the truthful beauty of a moral act carried through in the face of hideous and overpowering malice is like no other form of beauty.
It is beautiful despite its seeming futility. Fleeting by nature, it is beautiful not despite its evanescence, but because it is evanescent, and because usually there is no one there to witness it or remember it, and because it is intrinsically non-instrumental, hence woven deeply into the precarious web of aliveness that embraces all of us. You know what? Maybe, after all, this is the beauty that will outlive us. Thank you. That's great. Um, I haven't quite formulated it into a question, but I'm, I'm puzzled by uh, Picasso's reaction to Bonnard, who is yes. a, a lifelong icon, icon, along with Vuillard as well. Um, because there is, in fact, quite an amount of, of uh, cubism in Bonnard's painting. Mm -hmm. They are not polar opposites. If you study what he does uh, with tables, they open onto you and into you. They, have absolutely, they bear absolutely no resemblance to the proper perspective in which you would see the table and the plates. They were, all the plates would fall off on our <laughs> tables. And, and, and this is a disjunction of, of, of traditional perspective, which is not the same as cubisms, and is not being done for the same reasons, but it's being done just as fearlessly, and, and with uh, it really the disjunction that David was talking about is very much present. Th these are not classical works at all. And, and I, so I, I, I wondered, I looked at them and wondered, and I, I, I thought, are, are you familiar with uh, Nicolas de Stael's landscapes? No. Uh, I think probably the true inheritor of, uh, of Bonnard's late work. So that's for another time. Somebody can ask a much more interesting question than that, I feel Well, sure. that's, no, that is, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, it sounds like you know a lot more about Bonnard than I do. Uh, I just love him, and I've read a bit, and, um, you know, certainly the standard claim is always that he didn't go through cubism, but you're right to see a, a, dis, a disjunction there. It's certainly not classical. It's, it's, it's you know, it's not impressionist. Uh, it's not cubist, but the idea that he was... Um, that he was, in fact, more influenced by cubism than some of the standard things <laughs> they say about him sounds right to me. But there's a tide in culture that sweeps up everybody who doesn't commit kitsch. Mm -hmm. uh, and everyone who doesn't commit kitsch, which is the only way you can resist what is in the air and what is happening, uh, it, it actually belongs. It's just that Picasso didn't want it to. Well, but you see, the, the whole question of kitsch is the one that, that, that really, because there's so many people who dismiss Bonnard as kitsch. Um, uh, you know, in, in the way that this wonderful choreographer, Nacho Duaro, is fired from, um, you know, the Berlin Staatsballet um, because his works are too beautiful. They're yeah. just absolutely beautiful. Um, at, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Can, can, yeah, can I raise a question? Because both Susan, you, and David did something which David qualifies you didn't. You're standing on the west coast of Ireland, mm -hmm. and you're looking at this amazing color postcard of the sea and the land. And David, you're... I mean, Peg Olin's photographs are, you know, are unbelievable, right? And we, okay, we, we can, I mean, that they're a kind of a aestheticization already of landscape. But you then imbue from your perspective this landscape with a kind of moral beauty. I was thinking of the Irish peasant who never looked up from his plow. You evoke the shepherd the shepherd doesn't see Peg Olin's landscapes. The shepherd sees the space in which he is working. This romanticization of beauty, which is a 19th century invention. I can, I can almost date it for you, right? I mean, there's this moment where people start to say, 
mountains. They're so cool. <laughs> Where this damn Swiss who've been living in the mountains look and say, tourists, so cool. They're coming from England and they want to look at our mountains. We don't have to worry now about starving to death on these damn mountains. I mean, it, 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 well, morally, I agree with you. And it was morally, Amari is right. Morally, David, what you're doing, my God, I wish I had the moral ability to put my body on the line as you are doing. I really mean that. It strikes me that we're verging really on the edge, edge of kitsch when we start to aestheticize these landscapes because they are our sense of beauty. I think we have to be careful of saying, yeah, they're our sense of beauty because we don't have to do the shit work that makes them actually useful rather than beautiful. So um, I'm 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 gonna um, you know just bite the bullet there and <laughs> say, Sander, um, what if we learn something? What if the Swiss peasants learn something? So I've been going back to this one particular place in Ireland uh, for ten years now. Um, it's true, if you rent one of the smaller cottages, the windows are really small, um, and. It, you know, I just assume it was hard and expensive to heat, okay? Yeah. And you can also see ruins of cottages on this stony soil where people gave up trying to make a living and uh, went off to America. Certainly after the family. But yeah. you also meet people who will say, uh, I was born here, I grew up here, and I don't take it for granted. Okay. I accept that completely. They buy into that romanticization of space. No, they they perceive something. I mean, I, the only reason. So the reason that I brought up, I I, I mean, I I like your challenge because it seemed to me that natural beauty um, is there. There's not. There's nothing problematic about a unity of natural beauty and truth. And just possibly, um, that's a religious conception that I've got, okay? Um, I mean, I did say, I, I you know, uh, I, uh, I feel moved to religious language when I see certain pieces of natural beauty. Now you can say, well, of course you do, Susan. You grew up in the West. You were raised as a Jew, not a terribly religious one, but you have certain religious conceptions. OK, maybe. Um, but I guess yeah. I would also want to argue that it's just possible that, one, you know, as I think we make moral progress sometimes. By the way, I wasn't making a moral claim about that kind of beauty. I was just saying it is. I think it's truth. Um, but um, it is just possible that as we learned um, that there is something um, absolutely outrageous about child sacrifice, which was simply a form of life in you know, most of the ancient world all over the place. Just as we learned, wait a second, there was something we didn't see. It's just possible that we learned to open our eyes to particular pieces of beauty in the natural world that were taken for granted as long as people had to, you know, um, knock themselves out from, from uh, can't see to can't see, as they, uh, as a slave said, um, you know, and, and had no, uh, no way of perceiving that. Just one more thing, and I'm going to let David. Can I, can I just say one more, one, one more thing that I have noticed? I don't know if anybody else has noticed. Um, it's very, very hard if you take smallish children. Um, in fact, I would say any age child to a beautiful natural landscape. They're absolutely uninterested in standing still and looking. They want to climb, they want to explore, they mm -hmm. want to do something. The ability to stand still and look in wonder is something that we learn as adults. I think we learned it in the 18th century. I don't think we learned it as adults. <laughs> um, Senator, I just wanted to say about the shepherds, although I don't really like you know, to speak in their name, but nonetheless, um, let me say that they do. I've heard them many times. 
speak about beauty, not because they've been corrupted by enlightenment notions or European notions, but because actually they're sensitive to it. One thing that they always say, for example, it's not quite the same thing, but it's very close. Uh, a lot of these boys in the old days used to work in Tel Aviv in construction. That's what Palestinian <coughs> they work on in Israel, you know. So that's no longer possible for them. Um, but they would have to sleep overnight in these construction sites in Tel Aviv, you know, and they would say to me, how do you people, that means us, you know, how do you, how do you sleep? Yeah, how can you sleep inside these boxes all over the glasses and stones and got metal and all this stuff? How is it possible even to breathe in those spaces? And, um, you know, you're absolutely right, of course, that a shepherd's life is utterly unromantic. Anybody who's actually spent time around goats knows that for They're sure. terribly but, yeah, stupid animals. Yeah, God. that's true. But that doesn't mean that they're insensitive to the natural beauty of the landscapes. It doesn't mean that. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, I mean, I think what I'm quibbling with is whether or not we should superimpose Western bourgeois values in order to give value to moral questions. In other words, you didn't say a word that I would have disagreed with. And by the way, as I said, my admiration for what you do and what Peg does is without question. I'm wondering whether we need to aestheticize it, man. I really wonder whether we need to aestheticize it. Never, no question. Thank you very much for this very effort, 25 years. Uh, hardly most of the people here in the country making it possible don't speak English, I have to admit. My English is quite poor too, and let's, let's, let's be uh, straight about it. Uh, we, we talk globalish, and mm -hmm. maybe it's uh, still possible to understand each other. Just two short comments. First on Sander, German. Yeah, I think it's the, the basis of it with Kant is the, is the, is the table of modalities uh, in judgment. And there is three modalities, as Nögerath and Benjamin knew. Uh, he brought it up, actually. It's the apodictic philosophy. It's the hypothetic national science experience. Mm -hmm disjunctive, but mm -hmm. we still long to get it together. And maybe the moral inflection is even more important. And that brings me to the holy lands, the empty holy lands. Why do they, fuck's sake, have to be empty? There's always somebody living there to be slaughtered. So when do we learn that the holy lands are not empty? Thank you very much. So David, I want you to say more about the relation between the beautiful and the ugly. Because sometimes it seems like the beautiful in the way you describe is dependent on the ugly. And mm -hmm. your own very beautiful, there was a passage there where you were describing the clouds and the birds. And, yeah. and there was a tension behind it. What made it so poignant was that there was some shadow, dark shadow of evil behind it. And but on the other hand, sometimes you're talking as if you, when you're walking alone at night, as if it doesn't depend uh, on evil and ugliness. So are there two kinds of beauty? Well, I actually tried to shy away from defining beauty, as you may have noticed, <laughs> except for the beauty of a moral act, which I think is a kind of beauty that we need to somehow... And, and uh, that you know, requires yeah. evil. Yeah, I, it does. It requires, it, does, it requires evil. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Could be a very minor moral act, but nonetheless. You're describing yeah. your love for that land. The way you described it was very much in its being hurt somehow, and you were feeling mm. it. It the the the, the, the pleasure and the mo and the aesthetic mm. connection to it yeah. was because somehow it was being attacked and poisoned and it's stolen. True. And no, I, it's certainly true for me. However, you reminded me of a verse from Auden, uh, the beautiful poem about Yeats. When Yeats died, he says, Mad Ireland hurt you into poetry. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> Can I just say that years ago, David and I, we walked in the hills of Hebron when none of this, uh, this particular ugliness had happened. Mm 
and it was very beautiful, and you, you <laughs> knew how yeah. beautiful it was. Yeah. It yeah. didn't need the evil to make it beautiful. Um, my question is also for David, but um, maybe it opens up more broadly um, to something that came up in the discussion already. It has to do with a comment, David, that you made when you um, spoke about the settlers. Um, you said maybe some of them at least also love the land. I believe some of them do. Um, but still they manage to have some kind of uh, almost pathological um, mind. Um, and um, the pathological... Um, situation was created by what you called um, a relation to the absolute. Mm. Yes. And I want actually to ask whether w if we are um, out here to rehabilitate the notion of the beautiful, perhaps, as I think we are and I'm all for it actually, um, then perhaps also a, a rehabilitation of the absolute is required. Um, 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 I think it was Eva who jumped at Susan and said there is no absolute beauty. I'm willing to subscribe to that. Um, but perhaps we need the absolute in order to speak about beauty, which doesn't mean there has to be absolute beauty, not necessarily in any case. And um, the que so the question goes like that. Um, in the end, the ultimate expression of beauty that you spoke about was not just of the land, but of the no, right, of the word no. Um, those moments I took to be moments in which perhaps we need to speak not just of the beautiful, but of something like the sublime. And the, dis the difference between them is not necessarily um, as great as, say, Kant would have thought. Um, namely, when you say no, you do this in the name of um, something absolute. And the experience that's revealed through this no is um, something that's higher than, uh, yeah. So, Omri, I have a lot to say about that. And I'll just say one or two sentences, I think, because I... Uh, I have a book coming out um, in another two or three months about this kind of work in the South Hebron and so on. So there's a long chapter there about those moments of saying no. And I, you know, I don't want to go into it too deeply at the moment, but I can say that um, I don't think I would use the word sublime. I don't think I would touch Kant's word there. But these are moments of the inner freedom one does feel, it's an amazing discovery, an empirical discovery for me, that when you say no under those kinds of conditions, you say no in that kind of way, you feel, and there's some, again, it's a bodily thing, you feel a kind of amazing enhancement, intoxicating feeling of freedom. It's not a discovery of mine alone. Many people have recognized that, you know. So that is one direction that I would want to go. But in terms of the absolute, so here I, I wanted to say, not as somebody who goes down to South Chevron every week and so on, but as a person who's interested in India, that I have banned the word absolute from all of my classes. <laughs> I don't allow my students to say it, and I think it's a mistake, actually, when it comes to India. I don't think that there is such a notion, apart from the projection of some kind of absolute metaphysical notion that Western scholars of India have projected upon the Indian materials, you know. Well, I want to say, first of all, thank yes. you to all yes. three of you, because I thought those were three diverse but immensely interesting and sometimes often, actually, moving presentations. But this is again for you, David, um, and it's about the, the point that you made towards the end about futility and um, the connection between futility, possibly futile saying no, and beauty. Now, that seems to me right, that that's, that that's possible as far as it goes. But it also seems to me worrying if the no is a very final no. So if, if at the very end of it all, if that no is followed by another no, and another no, and another no, and this whole sequence culminates at the end yeah. in complete silence and destruction, then I think the connection you were trying to draw, and it was very moving, and I, and I, and I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you about this, this beauty in overcoming conflict point, um, perhaps in opposition to Wendy here, because I, I see suppressed conflict 
even there when you're walking alone yeah. in, the, in, in the challenges that that environment poses. Right. But it seems to me that if the last word is the word of the, of the wicked, as you use that <laughs> wonderful yeah. word, uh, yeah. um, that's probably even more anachronistic than, than beauty. Um, yeah. Yeah. To, to if the last word is the word of the wicked, I wonder about the connection. Uh, between futility and beauty. Right, yeah, so that's an interesting point. Um, I should say about wicked that I much prefer, I always use it in these contexts yeah. rather than evil because wicked to me has a slightly more personal uh, sound to it. Wicked is some kind of, sorry, it's, it's, um, wicked is a real thing I can come to grips with. Evil feels to me like a kind of abstraction, so I tend to prefer and Bad it. is too pallid and wrong is too pallid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but in terms of the futility, so that's a complex thing, you know. Um, we are humans, the activists and all that, we ask ourselves all the time if we're having any effect, if what we're doing is working. Uh, we occasionally like to count up the you know, successes that we've had. They're very microscopic, you know, this is on a very microscopic level. We cannot produce political change. But we have been able to restore thousands of acres of land to their owners, to their original owners. So occasionally, you know, we look back at that with some sense of satisfaction. But the reason I even mention that is because I think that Wittgenstein is right in the Tractatus when he says that um, ethics, an ethical action, has, it cannot be connected to instrumental results. It cannot be to punishment or reward or whatever it is. It has to have some kind of intrinsic uh, value, valence of, uh, of its own. And I mean, I think that that's right. Whether that um, somehow impacts upon the linkage to beauty, which is what you're asking or not, is a very interesting question. If there's nothing but futility, I would have to say that instinctively, I think that silent, unattested act is still beautiful, actually. <laughs> but I suppose if it went on forever to the end of time, maybe it wouldn't have any more so be beautiful. So I think there is a connection with hope here, you, that yeah. you hope that it will have its meaning through... Yeah. Um, so even if the person who says the no is destroyed, yeah. you hope that that action will have a meaning yeah. through making some other life better. That's true. And without that... Yeah. I worry about the connection with beauty. So I, you know, I make a distinction always when I talk about these kinds of things, which is incidentally something I don't do very often, but um, I make a distinction between optimism, which I think is a kind of very shallow, mentalistic kind of thing, and hope, which comes from deep inside the human being. It's, we might call it a spiritual act, if you want to use that word, although that's another one of these words I tend yes. to have banned. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Susan, so what happens in a world where there is no beauty? Do we create something that we call beauty, which doesn't resemble the beauty that we encounter here? Or do we simply live without beauty? Um, Jean Améry certainly entered a, a land without beauty, but there was an exit. But what happens if there is no beauty? And David, uh, you can try convincing me you're not religious. <laughs> Forget it. Um, yeah, we've had this discussion. Before. And um, there's this, speaking of futility, there's this great toast um, of the Soviet dissidents let us drink to the success of our hopeless endeavor. <laughs> but I need to ask you something. Um, the windows in that settlement were small, probably for reasons of self-defense. It's more difficult to throw a stone or throw a Molotov cocktail. And um, among those shepherds, there were also murderers. Children were killed in South Hebron Hills. Is the wickedness of the righteous morally irrelevant, aesthetically irrelevant? The wickedness of the righteous? Yeah. Who are the righteous? Well, the righteous in, in your description where yeah. the shepherds, they also commit violence. Yeah. Is this irrelevant because they're right? 
there's a factual thing here, and then I'll address the irrelevance question. I think the population that I've been working with for the last 20 years almost, um, their security record, if you want to use the language of the army, is pretty damn clean. They're not the ones who have entered settlements and you know killed families. These are other people. And I, I don't believe that this population that I'm working with has um, what are called terrorists in the standard language. I don't think so. Um, there was one case of a man, a settler who was killed on the hills and they tried to pin it on these settlers um, and they also punished them collectively, on these, uh, sorry, shepherds, yeah. They punished them collectively very severely but actually it was never proven. I think later it turned out that it was somebody who came from the city of Yata. So I tend to think that we're talking about um, relatively innocent population. That doesn't mean that they're great tzaddikim. They're not. They're human beings. They do all kinds of things and sometimes you know, they're not so great. But um, even were they to have been responsible for serious crimes, of course that would be relevant. Of course it's relevant. Um, yeah, so a world without beauty uh, is clearly what Amory was describing in Auschwitz. And in that essay, uh, he contrasts his own experience and his own reaction to that of a friend and comrade who was in prison in Dachau. And he describes how he first, um, I don't know if you know the essay, if you don't, you must, you should, okay, you do. Um, and he says, he f reading the book of this friend of his, he f has first felt ashamed because the friend is thinking about Maimonides and the friend is, you know, d uh, doing various things that seem to Amory to be absolutely beyond his reach. And then he says, um, you know, look, Dachau had a library. Um, I mean, there, there are distinctions. In, in, in it, it not only had a library, it functioned fundamentally differently. Uh, than Auschwitz did. Uh, there are some people who find it obscene to compare concentration camps, but I think one has to, um, you know, if you want to understand something about what was going on. So let's say, well, that's what the world would look like um, without beauty. I was actually going through, I was glad David answered first, because I was going through my head and trying to see if I could imagine a world without beauty other than that. And, and of course, um, um, there are all kinds of horrible things that have happened. You can even think of, I don't know, I mean, maybe a landscape that's been destroyed by nuclear war, maybe Hiroshima after uh, the, you know, the, one can think about, about possibilities, but the truth of the matter is, I think a world without beauty, um, it's possible, but I don't think it's livable. I really don't. And, um, and I don't think we could just go on and say, yeah, well, um, you know, Zemayesh or uh, whatever. I, I really don't. I think if, if you're, you know, and, and the interesting thing, that Sandra and I will talk about this over dinner or some, some other point of time, I don't think there has to be a universal formula for beauty in order um, for us to talk about beauty. I think it's a good thing that um, many of us have different, even if we're just talking about natural beauty, um, very different images um, in, in mind. For David, it's a desert. Um, for me, it's something else. But I think without the ability, w without some piece of that in our lives, uh, and the ability to perceive it, I, I, I think we, uh, you know, the whole description of the Muslim man, um, the living dead, um, is I think what we would wind up being. Let me, let me just add one thing. The difficulty with the notion that each of us uses beauty in a kind of personal way and that then we have a consensus to agree that all of these um, are in a sense um, linked or analogous or metaphorically equivalent means in the end that it's a useless concept, right? Um, if, if I can bring a, an analogy, because I, I like this. The Jean-Anne-Marie uh, essay has a wonderful pendant uh, in Primo Levi's first book. You, you know the story, right? Primo Levi um, is going to um, save his own sanity uh, by teaching Italian to a young French boy. And he's going to do it 
by teaching him Dante. What else, right? What else? And so he teaches him the beginning of Dante. You'll know this notion of coming into the forest. I don't have to go on. And this is an unbelievable chapter about sanity and culture and beauty and art in Auschwitz, I know, I know. right? Written after 45. 15 years later, he goes to a meeting of the survivors. And the young French boy, who is no longer so young, is there. And Levy says to him, do you remember how I taught you Dante? And the young boy says, bullshit, pure bullshit. And then Levy works this out in his third volume and says, why did I need to remember beauty in the space of the absence of beauty? I needed Dante. I needed Dante. Hölderlin doesn't work for Amari. I get very anxious when that becomes a kind of litmus test for beauty in the world. Yeah, okay? I think we should. Yeah, we've got several. We've got several questions now. Um, can, can I just ask one more? Uh, no. so much for that talk. A lot have been said and a lot have been heard as well. So I'm trying to find my language. Um, first of all, I, I want to go back to this life without beauty. Um, how do you think of, I mean, right now in the US, for example, suicide is a big talk because mm -hmm. of the recent news coverage. What do you think, and you said that um, it is not livable, right? Would you say that people who have give, given no to life are, have lost a sense of beauty. How do, you, how do you put that together? And maybe also going back again to the shepherd um, toiling under the sun, somehow my mind is still there. Um, I think there's, do you think that we should also differentiate the moment he's toiling under the sun and you know, um, working the, 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 the flock and going home, maybe telling stories to his family? So what is the role of imagination and storytelling in the creation of beauty? And my last question is about suffering. Um, there's a lot of suffering that you showed also in terms of conflict, the dissonance of beauty. And like the Buddha said, the only truth there is is suffering, right? So what does suffering brings to us to push us into kind of the edge of life, to, to ask the beauty, you know? When, when there's one writer, I forgot his name, he said, when my legs no longer work, it is just beauty that I see. No. Yes. Yeah, that's it. A lot of questions. No, um, questions for you, I think. No, they're not all questions the for me. Somebody, okay, the f with the first question, look. Um, so, Jeanne Marie, this, um, he's sometimes called a writer, he's sometimes called an essayist. I think I'm the only professional philosopher who keeps fighting to get him called a philosopher and put in the canon. Um, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, you know, I, I, it even occurred to me, so he never wrote a, you know, a systematic book of philosophy. Well, most analytic philosophers, uh, you know, write articles, so this is not an argument against it. But anyway, let's call him a philosopher. Um, um, it's, uh, I get to do that. And uh, he committed suicide. He also wrote a book in defense of suicide. And one of the things that he said in you know, is that the act of suicide is an act of absolute freedom. It can be an act of, of dignity, and it should contain a mystery that um, we don't have the right to plumb. So with Jean Marie, and of course people have talked about the reasons, and, and um, you know, and they'll talk about the reasons about Kate Spade and Anthony uh, uh, Bourdain, and, um, I don't, um, I do believe that there's a real, there, there should be, actually, uh, morally speaking, there should be, we should resist the attempt to try to, you know, open up and dissect an individual suicide. Um, nonetheless, I think it's really important to look at conditions that lead large numbers of people to commit suicide. Um, 
And you're perfectly right to say that rates not only of um, suicide, but also, uh, you didn't mention it, but mass shootings um, are a huge American problem. And it's not only a problem about our gun laws. It's, um, it's a problem about a sense of despair. And that is what I take it your question is, is getting behind now. The kind of no, I mean, um, again, I don't know what the incidence of, of depression is in the people working with Tayush, the organization that David has been working with for the last almost 20 years is. Um, there can certainly, and people that I know who work in, in various kinds of social justice uh, organizations, um, there's definitely a need for beauty. Yeah. Yeah. There's a need to stop. There's a need to stop saying no um, and actually say yes to something for a while, whether it's you know physical beauty or, or, or poetry or music or something like that. Um, but that's, if you like, a matter of sort of psychic and philosophical health. Um, you cannot say no to the world all the time and still stand up to say no the next time you need to say it. But I do think, you know, and this is again the question of how many times do you keep saying no, um, I do think the ability to say no um, sometimes um, and to do it in a concerted and as, you know, as effective a way as you possibly can, I actually think that's a source of strength against the despair and resignation that leads people to kill themselves. Since you've asked about suffering, I should tell you I have a prejudice against it. I don't like suffering. And I, but also, since you've asked it, I have to tell you, I mean, you've mentioned it in a Buddhist context, you know, so I want to tell you something that the Dalai Lama said. The first time I ever saw him was on television. I was in England, and he was being interviewed late at night. The interviewer was uh, this British guy, very kind of, you know, in a suit and tie and all of that. And this guy, said, he turned to the Dalai Lama, he was sitting there in his robes. So the, the interviewer said, uh, Your Holiness, he said, uh, is it true what we sometimes hear that you Buddhists think that the world itself and all of life is really about suffering? It's a kind of endless arena of pain and misery and suffering. Is that true? So the Dalai Lama, I don't know, some of you may have heard him and seen him. He looked at him and he started to laugh and he giggled like a child. Mm -hmm. And for a long time on television, I think at least a full minute, he laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and then he said, yes. <laughs> um, I, I want us to be very careful about eliding um, the, can we say, epidemiological appearance of suicide with um, individual suffering or social collapse and so forth and so on. Durkheim said this in the 19th century, that since then it's been a kind of a tourism. One of the things that we know is that um, there are national patterns of suicide. Um, the pattern, for example, in Colombia um, has a, a suicide peak, let us say, um, between 40 and 50 in the United States, there's two peaks, uh, one in the late teens up to the mid 20s, and then from the late 40s to the late uh, to, uh, to the mid 50s. Um, one can ask why these national structures. I think we are national structures. Um, Germany is, by the way, very different than France in that regard. Um, are are present. I get very anxious when people sort of reduce suicide to a kind of um, can we say universal malaise of any society? Uh, it has to do with access, it has to do with uh, flexibility, it has to do with um, the way that one's sense of integrity um, is defined in the cultures and the subcultures in which you live. Suffering is a tricky thing. Um, one of the things that struck me about um, Mother Teresa whose great claim to fame, of course, is that she set up hospices in India to take the dying off the streets, is that she didn't believe in palliative care. She didn't spend a nickel on alleviating the suffering of the people who were dying in her hospices. They were horror chambers. 
Oh, you've been no, in them. No. Oh, you, have you been in them? Oh, no. oh I, I, one of my interesting trips to India, I managed to visit one of her, one of her uh, hospices. And when you talk to the sisters, they said, yes, I mean, that's, that's what our aim is. Our aim is for people to have a natural death without any intervention and that suffering, and here I will more or less quote, it's been about 20 years, but more or less quote, like our Lord on the cross, <laughs> right, <laughs> is what our goal is. I did not think this was a good thing. So when people talk to me about suffering in the abstract, maybe I can give a minute of giggles, right? Um, suffering in reality ain't a good thing. And societies who think that suffering as metaphor, we're fine. We all suffer. My God, I haven't had anything to eat. It's nine o'clock. I'm <laughs> suffering, right? It's not beautiful. It's wicked that I'm suffering. <laughs> We're going to get you dinner very soon, Ted. <laughs> My point, however, is let's be careful about language. Beauty as metaphor, suffering as metaphor is very, very different than the lived experience of things like suffering. You know, there's a certain bullshit quotient I find when I hang out with philosophers that strikes me as something that one wants to answer. Not all philosophers. I was thinking more of some of our um, but can we say post-colonial and post-modern friends? Um, we have three more questions. Well, and I would Martin, Martin, anyone on this list? Yes. Okay. No, no, we have four. Okay, I think. No, I'm as far away from my but Then there's the gentleman in the last row. Uh, yes, um, I'm surprised now. Okay, maybe I'm taking up uh, on the last point, but I forgot it now. No, I, I start how I wanted to start. Uh, the question of romanticization I wanted to pick up again, and I thought about that maybe there is this kind of connection one can draw between what uh, Susan said uh, about the question of uh, overcoming the chains or decorating the chains by truth. And I thought about that in connection to the, the shepherds or the, the, the beauty in, of, of, of the landscape and uh, the people living there. Uh, and my question is if there, if, if, if we can apply this difference on this situation. Right? Because if a, if a farmer or a shepherd is having a personal relationship to the nature, to the plants, to the animals, and so forth. In this relationship, there can be, or this relationship can become beautiful, and can become a moment of overcoming the chains of um, the material necessity of, of, of farming, or the the, the daily uh, uh, um, uh, thoughts which you which you mentioned, and so forth, uh, and also overcoming the violence in the whole situation. Uh, so, and that is also a word against the uh, absolute in a sense because this is changing from moment to moment. You can have at one moment this deep personal, let's say, dialogical relationship to, to nature or animals and in the next moment it can be a violent situation. So, this is an, a thought which I wanted to bring in and maybe you can comment on it. Okay. Shall we collect? It's a light out. Yeah. Um, I also, I would like to come back to <clears throat> beauty as a universal formula. And um, thank you so much. Um, and I would like to um, um, say what I take away um, from your um, amazing presentations. Um, you, ta we, uh, you talked about three different, very different kinds of beauty. Uh, the first one was the beauty maybe invented in the 18th century, the aesthetic experience and what is directly connected with it is that there's always a split between subject and object. I'm, I'm distanced from something so I can look at it and it gives this <coughs> coherent impression. Um, that is a sense of <coughs> or something that is acquired taste, uh, something culturally acquired 
under specific, specific circumstances. And we can, of course, um, develop that gaze and use it wherever we like. Uh, a second um, kind of beauty, <coughs> um, I think, is mm, connected with uh, the whole issue of the land. And in this uh, context, uh, I would really <coughs> speak of a di totally different kind of uh, beauty. I would exchange the term beauty for sacredness. And this is the term that is used in non-Western cultures all over the world. Uh, it's always the land uh, that gives life, takes life, that, uh, to which life returns. It's part uh, of, a, of a cosmic energy. It is also part of tradition, of culture. It's inscribed. In, there are so many ways to connect to it, to live for it, to live on it. And um, there, I think, beauty is not really the, the, ki uh, the, the right word. It, it would rather be uh, the sacredness of this land because it belongs to everybody. Of course, you cannot possess it and cannot take it away with you or uh, deprive anybody else from it. And the third um, concept of beauty would be the moral beauty. And you said um, the most beautiful word in ev every language is no. Uh, no is the, <coughs> inter it's not the, I prefer not to, of course, not that kind of no. Yeah. It's uh, the intervention. No, um, there's a line, I'm not um, going along. Um, that kind of resistance, and I think this is a, um, equally amazing knowledge, um, beauty, and uh, here I would like to come back to another sentence, what you said, God is the <coughs> most vulnerable uh, of all of us. So um, here I think what you said about the witness is also important. There has to be uh, some kind of a witness for this act of, of uh, the moral, and um, at the same time you, you call yourself a witness, but then you said there is no witness. But of course it has something to do with this kind of higher moral obligation, which is again something very important. I wouldn't necessarily necessarily use the word beauty for it and would not like to confuse all these different kinds of uh, yeah. Yeah, very important and fundamental things uh, that you uh, ta uh, taught us and told us about uh, with this one word of beauty. Then we have one last intervention. No, Thomas, no, no? Okay, then we ask uh, There's someone. Uh, Sarah Bass. Oh, yeah, I, I um, take the mic, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess this is for David. I also really enjoy the, um, all the talks. Um, I worry a little bit about um, maybe it's the epistemic status, or I don't care how you, what adjective you use, of the broadly aesthetic experience that you talk about. You talk about um, the truthless beauty of a moral act, and several times you say you know it in your body. You talk about exhilaration. And I can just think that many of the people on the other side have what they would describe as experiences of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, and they are motivating and strengthening and empowering and so on. And so I'm wondering what, again, what sort of significance or status you give to that experience. It seemed really important. It seemed almost action guiding or a criterion but I worry about it's playing any of those roles. Yeah. So how do we, Go ahead. Do we answer? Okay. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just start with the last question and then I want to say something to Alida. Um, I, I understand the question very well. I've also written about this because of course, you use a word like freedom. I use the word about freedom. So of course, yeah, you say to yourself, gosh, uh, you know, soldiers feel maybe some kind of liberation, do they? I was in a war, it didn't seem to me like that. I didn't notice even a single one who felt free, but let's say some do, that is a disinhibition. And maybe terrorists who kill themselves in suicide bombs, maybe they feel some kind of freedom, I don't know. But I would be prepared to argue, it's not something I can give you any kind of, you know, scientific or medical uh, evidence to support, but I would be prepared to argue that those notions of dis disinhibition or release or whatever it is have nothing to do with the kind of things that I was describing. And I don't think that um, people who are involved in causing cruelty to other beings, I don't think that they have an experience of beauty that in any way resembles the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Even though they might say, you know, 
Ah, oh, it was beautiful. I shot at him and I ate him and he died. They might say and think that. That doesn't mean it's the same experience. You know. But it could be that this is just me. I can't offer you some kind of you know, proof for it. Um, Elijah, I wanted to thank you for the three um, distinct categories. Um, by now, you're probably beginning to notice that I um, take a kind of powerful aversion to certain words. Sacred is another one. <laughs> I don't use it. I, you know, I'm in India all the time. They've never heard of such a thing. They, the word doesn't exist. There is no such notion. It's an it's a analytical term that we, we have. You know. But I, I think, nonetheless, that I, I know what you're, what you're saying. Um, there was something in the final thing that you said there about the moral beauty that I, I'm now forgetting what it was that you said. Can you remind me? There was something I wanted to, re, to respond to. Yeah. About witnessing? Oh, witnessing. Yeah, you said it, but thank you. Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is a really good question, this question about uh, witnessing. A lot of the time, uh, you're really alone. Even if there are one or two people with you who might also remember someday or bear the witness, but basically, it's not going to be not going to be remembered. So who is that witness? Is it some, you know, godlike entity, or is it something that is some part of the world that you know some people believe things like that? Um, the notion that God is the most vulnerable of all of us. That is, I can show you a, you know, a text in a particular context in a story from the Mahabharata where that's what they say exactly. And that somehow speaks to me, you know. I don't think there were any direct questions addressed to me. And since I'm concerned about uh, suffering, even in the minor sense, I don't want my guests to be hungrier than they have to be, I'm going to pass. Well, let me end where I began. This is the Einstein fall. <laughs> this is what we've done for 25 years. Um, we leave with more questions than we came with <laughs> because if we answered all of them, we would have celebrated only our first anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I will remind you that there are two more days of unanswerable questions by people who are smart enough to know that they are unanswerable. And I'll see you all here tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you so much.